Everybody, can you hear me? Cool. Okay, so welcome to my presentation about how AI thinks. Now, I'll dive into a little bit about me and why I think you should care about this presentation in a minute. But I just want to preface this by saying this is not your typical AI is not going to replace human creativity or how to prompt chat GPT talk. We're actually going to be diving a little bit deeper into the algorithms that you guys use on a day-to-day -day basis as marketers. Um, and I think having this knowledge of how the AI that you're using actually functions might help you exploit these systems a bit better. So here are the contents of this presentation. I'm going to spend about a minute talking about me and why this talk is relevant to you. And then we're going to get into the main meat of the talk. Um, so we're going to be looking at this concept of vectors. And I'll explain what this is if you don't know what it is and why it's actually important. Between each one of the parts, there's an opportunity for questions. So please feel free to raise your hands if you didn't follow anything and want to ask me something or want to share something with the audience as well. OK, so hi, I'm Nee here. Uh, I'm a PhD in Generative AI from Imperial College London. I've also been offered a guest lecture position there where I teach the masters in AI, um, some natural language processing. Uh, I have a startup as well. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I will shamelessly plug it at the end. OK, so let's start with why you're here and why I think this talk is relevant to you guys. Now, one key KPI of marketing and advertising is making money. And there are AI tools that, that are everywhere which facilitate this. There's Facebook's broad targeting algorithm, Google Search, even ChatGPT. So learning how these work can help you improve your KPIs. If you don't care about that, then what I'd say is uh, you'll learn some buzzwords in here, which you can definitely brag about to your friends. OK, so let's start with a bit of motivation. So here is a Google search that I've done, highly efficient methodologies to make money in marketing. Now, nobody really talks like this, and there isn't really a website which has this exact string of words together. These four search results that you see here are from the top page of Google. So why did this string return these search results when there's no direct keyword overlap? So I'm going to tell you the answer to that right now. And as we work through the presentation, I'll revisit this example towards the end. And you'll, you'll start to understand why Google has returned these search results to you. The answer is this notion known as vectors and similarity, and that's what the meat of this presentation is going to be about. Similarly, when we're on Google Photos or Apple Photos and we have this face recognition stuff, find people by what their face actually looks like, how does that actually work? How is this AI recommending? How is it knowing that this is my friend Harry and this is my nephew Jayan? I actually have no idea who this is, but there we go. OK, so let's get started and build some intuition about what's to come. Uh, so this is a bit interactive. I want people to just shout out, rank the words which are most similar to cat. Sorry? Dog? Dog, hippo, swimming. Yeah, correct. Why? Cool. So the answer was dog looks like a cat. Hippo has some similarities, did you say? And swimming has nothing to do with um, a cat or a dog. Now, I think this is a very human way about, of, of thinking about how these words are related to each other. But what if I told you that an AI algorithm doesn't actually care that a dog, is a, uh, a dog has four legs or has fur the same way that a cat does? Most of modern day AI is built on the concept of similar things appearing in similar contexts to something else. So in the context that we use the word cat in, the word dog is likely to appear as well. My pet cat is sleeping, and my pet dog is sleeping. Unless you're some zookeeper or um, some safari owner, we typically don't say my pet hippo, and we definitely don't say my pet swimming. I'm going to be diving a, a lot deeper into this over the next couple of slides, but the key takeaway from this point is that similar words appear in similar contexts. OK, next question. We have Zoe, and we have Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And these are Zoe's, Zoe's interests. She likes traveling, she likes marketing, and she's married. Take 20 seconds to look at this slide and tell me which profiles are most similar to Zoe. And by the way, please ignore gender. I completely forgot about that when I, when I made this slide. Um, but based on people's interests, who is most similar to Zoe? Bob? And then? 
Cool. So why why is it in that order? Yeah, exactly. Um, Bob likes advertising, which is vaguely related to marketing, probably quite related. Alice has no overlaps with Zoe, um, and Charlie is married, which is a, a commonality that Zoe and Charlie share. So this is how I would rank their similarity if we, if we were to ignore gender. Now, hopefully from the previous slides, you've kind of started to see how recommendation algorithms, such as the targeting algorithm on Meta or what you see on your TikTok, goes beyond keywords which are exactly similar to each other. For example, Zoe likes marketing, Bob likes advertising. They're not the same word, but they are related to each other. And these targeting algorithms, as you probably know, also go beyond just raw interests. So it might take into account behaviors, such as the time of day where people are most active. And we're going to take a look at how an algorithm can formulate all of this and how it reasons um, to actually recommend content to people. Now, what we're going to do is build on the previous two sets of slides, and we're going to dive deeper into how machines think about language. And then we'll look at examples of generalizing this principle to profiles, search, images, and even CRMs. OK, so let's get started with the meat of the talk, vectors. So I just need to give you guys a little bit of terminology, two things that you need to remember. Number one, what a vector is. And number two, what I mean when I say the word dimension. OK? So a vector is a row of numerical information. That's not the strict mathematical definition, but for the context of this talk, it's enough. And if you guys have ever looked at a table or worked with a spreadsheet, you guys have actually already used vectors. You know what a vector is. You just haven't associated the label, um, the label with the term. So we have two tables here. And I just want to drive home what I mean by vector and definition. So in each of the table, we have three vectors. In this table, we have an Alice vector, a Bob vector, and a Charlie vector. And in this one, we have ad set one, two, and three. Now, a vector is a row of numerical information. This has two columns, two, row, two, two pieces of numerical information per vector. So column one and column two, or the terms I'm going to be using, dimension one and dimension two. In here, we have four dimensions. Dimension one, two, three, four. Okay. So if you're confused, just think about a dimension as a column in a table. Now. Here is the motivating example that we're going to be looking at. I've come up with a list of animals and my definition of what it constitutes to be an animal. Basically, the cuteness of the animal and the size of the animal makes an animal what it is. So take a look at this for 20 seconds. And then can somebody tell me what are the two animals which are most similar to each other based on my definition? Elephant and dolphin, yeah. Why? Exactly, yeah. Now, it took you guys a couple of seconds to realize that, right? And this is only us looking at nine vectors with two dimensions. And even us as humans, we had to sit, think about this for 20, 30 seconds before we found out what two animals are similar to each other. But let's take a look at this in a different way. Here, I've represented it visually. And immediately, we see that elephant and dolphin are close to each other. We now have this spatial understanding of what a distance between vectors and dimensions actually are. We might also see how we can start to quantify what a distance is, OK? Two things being close to each other. Now, who remembers how to work out the distance between two points? And if you need a hint, think back to year nine maths and triangles. Sorry? Uh, close. Uh, Pythagoras theorem is the, is the answer. So don't worry if you don't care or want to follow the next few slides. Uh, I'll summarize the takeaway at the end of it. The key concept is if we have two points, one and two, we have a mathematical way of working out the distance between those two points. OK, so I've just taken two random points from our graph earlier on, wasp and hyena. Okay. 
And I've tried to map this to the triangle, uh, to the Pythagoras theorem that we actually have. So what we're trying to do is work out what this C variable actually is, and that quantifies how far away two things are to each other. Okay, so based on our definition of what a wasp is, i.e. it has a cuteness of two and a size of one, I fucking hate wasps by the way, um, and a hyena with a cuteness of 10 and a size of 30, we can apply our Pythagoras formula down at the bottom. I'm not gonna run through the maths, but we can basically get some quantification, some number of how similar or how far away these two points actually are to each other. So the takeaway is, is that a wasp and a hy hyena are 30 points, 30 animal units away from each other. Okay? So once again, this is probably uh, the most important takeaway from this slide. For any two points, we can say how far apart or how close they are from each other. And the number of dimensions doesn't actually matter. So what this means is we actually have some mathematical way of formulating how far away or how similar two items are. Now to prove this point, let's add a third dimension to our animal table. I've added the row ferocity, which just implies how aggressive the animal actually is. Now what we can do is we can plot this in 3D. And, uh, is this playing? Okay, so um, bear with me because visualizing a 3D graph when you don't have a mouse to play with is uh, pretty hard. So I've just recorded a short video. Hopefully it can give you guys some intuition about how these animals look in 3D space. But there are two key things to take away from here. One, the same way that we can plot our animals in 2D, we can plot them in 3D, as we're seeing. And two, our distance formula extends to higher dimensions. So based on what our definition of an animal actually is, size, cuteness, and ferocity, we still have a way of working out how far away or how close two animals are to each other. Okay, so that's the background knowledge. Do you guys have any questions or things that you want me to explain or dive into a bit more details? Sorry? This is not modeling. This is. Um, we're not looking at not modeling anything. We just have rows of data and we're looking at how we can visualize that. Oh. Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay, so recap. In the previous section, we covered two things. One, what a vector is and how we can visualize them. And two, the notion of the distance and similarity between vectors. But what about words or language? How can we represent words as vectors? And what does that even mean? So we're revisiting the slide that I introduced earlier. Now, answering the specific question of how do we get vectors for words requires us to have probably our master's level knowledge in AI, so it's out of the scope for this talk. But the key takeaway that we can get is understanding the intuition behind what happens when we have these vectors. So, Modern NLP is built on this notion, you should know a word by the company it keeps. And this was a quote by um, a linguist called J.R. Firth in 1957. And fundamentally what this means is that similar words will appear in similar contexts to each other. For example, over the scope of the English language, the word cat appears in a similar context to the word dog, less so the word hippo. And as I mentioned earlier, we will rarely ever see the word swimming in the same context as cat, dog, or hippo. Although hippos do swim, so uh, bear with me on that. Oh. Okay, so according to modern NLP, the definition for the word dog is similar to the definition of the word cat. And we're gonna dive into this over the next couple of slides. Now, uh, just say I've switched the example to king and queen. Um, you'll see why in a couple of slides, but everything I said before holds true. Now, what you're looking at here is the word vectors for a king and a queen. This is how a computer understands a word. It understands the word king by 0 0.50451, 0 0.68607, and so forth, 
And note that I've had to cut it off at the end because it's way too long and you guys don't want to be looking at bor uh, boring decimal places. Neither do I. We're going to take a look at it visually in a second. But two things. One, a word vector is the numerical definition of what it is to be a word. The same way that we had a numerical definition of what it was to be an animal, we can have that for a word. But the difference here is we don't actually know what each dimension means. We don't know what 0.50451 actually means. Let's take a look at this in a bit more detail. OK, so what I've done here is I've taken the vectors for the word king and for the word queen, and I've plotted the intensity of each one of the dimensions. Now, there are 50 dimensions in, this, in, uh, in the data that I've used. And this was the norm a couple of years ago. But now, when you're working with GPT, GPT-3 represented words in almost 13,000 dimensions. So over the last couple of years, these LLMs, the large in LLM, has really become large. OK, so how should we interpret this diagram? If a value is close to negative 2, it's going to be dark red, for example, here and here. If it's close to positive 2, it's going to be this intense blue or purple color. I'm colorblind, so I can't actually tell the difference between the two, but basically similar to this uh, value of queen here. OK, now you know what you're looking at. Let's try and interpret this. What I've done here is I've shown the word vectors for king, queen, man, and woman. And as I mentioned on a previous slide, humans, no. AI experts do not know what this means, OK? However, once we have these vectors, we can try to make a best guess of what each one of the dimensions actually represents. Now, note that in practice, this is mostly a useless exercise. But for the purpose of building intuition, it's actually quite useful. So what I've done here is um, I've just highlighted this particular dimension. And we can see that we have values which are more intense for woman and queen and slightly for king, but don't have intensity for man. So I was trying to rationalize, what could this mean? What is a feature or an attribute that woman, queen, and a king might have slightly in common, but a man wouldn't have? Um, and the best examples I came up with was they have this aspect of long hair, for example. You typically tend to hear women and queens having you know, longer hair, or maybe they dress better. Sorry for the men out there. Um, but yes, the idea is, is like, each one of these dimensions has some certain attribute or meaning. Us as humans, we don't know what this means, but a machine can actually make, uh, can have an interpretation of what each one of these dimensions means. So exercise to you guys. We see these values more intense for king and queen. What could that mean? Crown. Yep, crown. Crown could be one. I came up with royalty and power as well. Um, those could also be attributes that king and queen share, which a man and a woman don't really uh, have in common. OK. And here I'm showing you words which are largely unrelated from each other. And you can see the discrepancy between them. You can see the word woman and end are not related at all. And therefore, their word vectors are very far apart from each other, and they look very different. So the key takeaways here are Intuitively, we know that man and woman are similar to each other because the context that we use the word man in would also use the word woman in as well. And here, we can see that visually, that the word vectors for man and woman are pretty similar to each other when compared to TV and end. Now, man, TV, and end are all nouns. And by that virtue, they have, I wouldn't say a lot of similarity, but more similarity than a word which isn't a noun. So you might say the man stood or the TV stood, for example. Um, so we do use these words in vaguely similar contexts. And we don't really use the end stood um, at all. So we can see that the definition of the word end is far apart from the definition of the word man or the definition of the word woman. OK, so um, the key takeaway from what I'm trying to show you is that similar words have similar definitions to each other, or similar vectors, rather. And what I've done here is I've just used some data science techniques to visualize these 50-dimensional vectors on a 2D graph. And what you can see is that words which are similar to each other are clustered close together. So the word, um, this is under the context of football, I guess, the word um, 
ball and kick are quite close to each other or quite related to each other. Therefore, they're close to each other in terms of the definition of the vectors. The word kick and foods are not really used in the same context, so you can see that they're actually quite far apart from each other. Okay, now that we know what a word vector is, we're going to answer the question of why is this useful? Under what context do these machines actually use, uh, do the AI algorithms that we work with actually use this technique? Um, before I continue, I understand that there was a lot to go through in that last section, so I'm happy to spend a couple of minutes just taking questions or brainstorming, um, trying to clear up any misunderstandings. Yeah, so the question was, is the same, is the same idea used with images and tags? So, yes and no. Um, tagging images was quite an old school way to do it, where you would use the raw tag itself to understand the contents of the image. So we, if we had a picture of the word cat and we tagged it as cat and sunlight and somebody searched for the word cat, we would look for the tags of the word cat. What we're moving to now is this concept of vector-based searching. So if we could represent an image as a vector <coughs> and we had some textual understanding of what was in that image, which is possible now with uh, modern day AI algorithms, we can just search for the word cat and the machine, uh, the machine learning algorithm itself would understand, hey, everywhere we see a cat, this is what a cat is, without the need for any tags. Not explicitly, but internally. Like, if we think about things in terms of vectors, right? And you have a picture of a cat. That picture of a cat is going to have a vector which is similar to the word vector of the cat. So because the image vector and the word vector are similar to each other, you can say, hey, whenever we have this word vector of the word cat, find an image which has a similar definition by using the notion of similarity that we looked at in, in the motivating example. Yes, the, the vectors are abstracted away from the humans, so we don't care about this, but under the hood, that's what's actually happening. Okay. So let's generalize this principle. I'll give you a brief recap. So vectors can be considered numerical definitions. And words can be represented by vectors. Similar words have similar vectors, as we looked at in the man and woman example. And most importantly, we can calculate distance between vectors. What this means is if we have two of the same vector, if we have a man vector and a man vector, they're exactly the same. The distance between them is zero. If we have a man vector and a woman vector, the distance between them is small because they are similar definitions. If we have two vectors that are far apart, for example, woman and end, the distance between them is large. OK, so why did I tell you all this? Well, thankfully, the hard part is done. Now that we know this, we can generalize this uh, principle to the technologies that you actually use on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, search, images as you were mentioning, the targeting algorithms that power Facebook, and also what I think CRM should be doing, but they actually don't, so it's a bit more of a theoretical brainstorming exercise about how we could utilize vectors in CRMs. But anyway, let's revisit the example of search. Now, I should have prefaced this earlier on, but I'm not an expert in SEO, so those of you who, are, who probably have some uh, better knowledge of me than when it comes to the actual rankings of the, of the web pages on there, um, by the way, before I continue, did anybody notice that about mid-2020 Google search changing? Where it went from, like, if I searched for something, it was showing me things with exactly the same keywords as what I searched for to something which was more semantic? Why did this happen? Vectors. Okay, so. As I said earlier, we have this string which doesn't have an exact keyword match anywhere. So how come these results are being recommended to me? The idea is, is that we basically have a vector for our query. We have some definition of what it means for highly efficient methodologies to make money in marketing. There is a vector which defines this sequence of words. And we have similar vectors for each of the titles that we're actually seeing from Google Search. So there'll be a vector for 12 proven ways to make money with digital marketing a vector for key elements of a successful marketing strategy. 
And what Google is doing under the hood is it's saying, find me similar vectors for this particular search query that's, uh, that I've searched for, okay? And as I said, the actual ranking of these search queries depends on uh, the SEO that you've actually implemented. But the filtering, the initial going from, hey, here are like 86 billion websites on the internet to finding the ones which are relevant happens by this vector-based search or this vector-based similarity context. Okay, similarly with uh, Google Photos and your example of um, uh, finding images by, by keywords. What's happening here? Each one of the faces has a vector associated with it. So my friend Harry will have a Harry vector associated with it. And as I take pictures, it looks at the faces. And if it sees any faces which have a vector similar to Harry, for example, then it will say, okay, this person is likely to be Harry. Now, note that this isn't flawless, which is why sometimes when we're looking at this, we see people who don't look like Harry at all or don't look like your friends. Um, and this is also affected by like lighting conditions and so forth. So this particular feature in Google, I would not say is as sophisticated as Google could actually make it be, but the concept is the same, that we have a vector for each one of the faces and those vectors are being matched up with every new photo that we take. If we see similar faces, then we put them together into one category. Okay, probably the most relevant to you guys, um, targeting algorithms. Now, it's the same example as before. I've just added this example of uh, 2 a.m. Uh, as a behavior trait that each one of these uh, fake people actually have. Now, let's say we showed an ad to Zoe and she clicked it. How do we know who else to actually show the ad to? So, let me briefly talk about targeting algorithms here. One example could be about Facebook's broad targeting algorithm, or it could be about the recommendation systems that power TikTok or Netflix, for example. And obviously, these algorithms are way more, than, way more sophisticated than what I'm defining here. Uh, but the core principle of this underlies these algorithms as well. So, how does this work? Um, so what I've done is I've said each one of our profiles has a vector. We have a Zoe vector, we have an Alice vector, a Bob vector, and a Charlie vector. Now, there are two scenarios, right? Let's say Zoe has clicked on the ad. In scenario one, both Bob and Charlie click. And their similarities were, they were both married, Zoe was married, and they both browse at 2 a.m. Zoe browses at 2 a.m. Let's say we have another scenario where only Bob clicks. Their interests were more aligned with each other. Zoe liked traveling and marketing, Bob liked traveling and advertising. So based on who clicks, the algorithm will then find who else to move forward and show the, profile, show the ad to. Okay, so let's say we're in scenario two where Alice doesn't click on the ad and Charlie doesn't click on the ad. Only Bob clicks on the ad. What is the thing here which made them click? Likely, it is the fact that um, either they enjoy traveling and they have an interest in marketing and they browse at 2 a.m. But what if the machine actually doesn't care about these hard-coded natural language attributes? What if what it did was say, hey, let's actually take an average of what it is to be a Zoe and what it is to be a Bob. Let's take the average of these two vectors and find other profiles which are similar to the average of Zoe and Bob. So let's make this more concrete. Let's say we have Daisy and Daisy enjoys marketing and she also browses at 2 a.m. And maybe Daisy clicks on the ad as well. So over time, the algorithm is getting more confident that hey, this notion of enjoying marketing and browsing at 2 a.m. is what makes people click on the ads. So what the algorithm does is it takes the average of the Zoe vector, the Bob vector, and the Daisy vector, and it finds other profiles which have vectors similar to Zoe, Bob, and Daisy, and it shows the ad to them. Okay, um, so CRMs. Now, I don't actually believe there is a CRM out there which utilizes vectors in the way that I've defined it, um, but what if it does exist? Let's take a minute to brainstorm and think about what could happen if we had a CRM that enabled customer vectors or profile vectors. Uh, so I want this to be interactive. Please feel free to shout out any ideas that you, that you might have.
Yes, exactly. So, um, sorry, what's your name? Stuart. So what Stuart said was, um, what I've described was a segment, and the segment is being used as targeting. And this segment was defined automatically by the AI algorithm. It came up with correlations which a human wouldn't have been able to come up with in terms of similarity. So what this means is, instead of saying, hey, people who have bought blue jeans and boots before, let's put them into one segment, we can now have an AI algorithm which automatically clusters each one of our um, customers based on similarity of browsing times, purchase history, and so forth, in a way that us as humans would be limited by our imagination. Actually, this was the number one point I had on my, uh, I had for the answer. Um, yeah, it can help identifying different customer segments. Now, obviously, this has a knock-on effect of uh, personalization. If we understand the individual characteristics of each segment, we can offer more personalized services, content, products, enhance the customer experience and loyalty as well. And we can also do some predictive an uh, analytics or analysis over this. We can forecast future behaviors, trends, preferences, and buying patterns. And I believe this stuff is all manual and intricately done by a human right now. But if these CRMs utilize more sophisticated AI algorithms, the world would be a different place. OK, so I'm going to leave you with a slide that about since 2019, um, most of the tools that you've been using which utilize AI have actually just been powered by vectors. Um, and I'll take questions in a minute, but it's just uh, time for my shameless plug. So uh, if you work for or work with a brand that has paid advertising as part of this funnel, please talk to me because I'm building an AI that can improve profits by over 30%. It basically predicts the full funnel and simulates your entire, um, uh, simulates your CPA and conversion rate. So you can play with every part of the funnel and see what performs best before you spend a single penny in paid advertising spend. That's it. This is a QR code. It has my WhatsApp on there. Please connect with me on there if you actually want to talk to me and stay in touch. Otherwise, um, connect with me on LinkedIn, and the link is there as well. Um, so thank you. That's my talk, and I'll happily take questions. Uh, no. I'm just going to take Let me grab a headset. Sorry. Do you mind passing me the? Thanks. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good content. Very educational. Super cool. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about how a vector might be used to forecast or predict? Sure. Uh, so the question was, could we use? Could I talk a little bit about more about how a vector might be used to forecast or predict? Yes. So a machine understands things in terms of numbers, right? If you're using something to forecast and predict, you basically need to feed in some historical trend of what's actually gone on. So there's a couple of ways that you can do this. One is you could manually handcraft features. Uh, I'm struggling to come up with a good example in my head. But you could say, like, um, what is this person most likely to buy if they have previously bought boots and blue jeans before? And we could manually handcraft those features and say, like, oh, um, Boots is going to be item number 73, and blue jeans is going to be item number 149. So if we feed in 73 and 149 to the algorithm, what is the next thing that they're most likely to predict or uh, most likely to buy? Or uh, are they likely to churn just based on these two things? However, that's a very naive way of doing things. Because if we had a profile vector which took into account absolutely everybody who has been on the website, we can find these latent correlations which actually exist. It might not be that blue jeans and um, boots have been what led people to actually churn. It might have been this combination of the city they live in. Maybe there was some, like, um, uh, maybe they'd recently switched devices. So maybe they started browsing. Maybe they were on an iPhone and bought on an Android phone, and then bought an Android phone, and the site was not optimized for Android. Um, and therefore, they're more likely to churn because they, the customer experience wasn't so good. So a vector can encapsulate all of this, all of this knowledge without having to have a human define and look at the data in itself. So if we had a vector, then we'd be able to, we could feed that into the machine learning algorithm directly and use that to actually predict what will happen next based on whatever you're trying to model. Hi. Do you happen to know if Amazon uses the same way of doing things? Because their search engine just seems so much less sophisticated than Google. And um, Amazon does have a similar way of doing the search. I think th the story of Amazon is quite interesting. They actually wanted to compete against Google when it came to search. 
but I think they completely lost out. I think the metrics that Amazon optimized for and the metrics that Google optimized for are quite different. Personally, I've never had a problem with Amazon search, but yes, under the hood, they are utilizing vectors. And I spoke to somebody who works on the Amazon ads team as well. They were saying that they have this concept of um, multimodal vectors. And what I mean by this is the search queries are based on the image vector itself alongside the text, which comes on, uh, which is the product definition or the product title as well. So yes, they are using vectors to power their search, but likely they might not have as powerful of a, uh, as powerful of a model, which is working under the hood to, to actually perform the search. Uh, we got one here. Thank you. I imagine this technology requires a lot of data to be able to build the vector, mm. and that technology would only be available to companies who can scrape or, or buy that much data. How would this be applicable for smaller companies or startups or, or, or companies who are not in the sort of the power range of Google or, or, or Amazon, for example? Mm, great question. So the question was, oh, you guys had the question? Okay, cool, great. Um, so. Since about 2018, the NLP or the AI community has been favoring this approach of what's known as a pre-trained and a fine-tuned model. So what a pre-trained model is, think of it as the equivalent of a generalist, right? So it has a lot of knowledge, and this has already been trained. So Google, uh, Amazon, Meta, Microsoft, they release these pre-trained models for research purposes. Now, the fine-tuning aspect is like, hey, we have this generalist here, let's use our small amount of data to update the algorithm based on whatever data we have. So if you only have 500 pieces of data, you can actually build a very good model based on the small amounts of data that you actually have because you're utilizing knowledge which is pre-trained and, and general purpose knowledge. You're basically just making a generalist into a specialist. Uh, considering the expense of creating vectors, uh, event data, like your example of time, or for example, location, would they be included in the vectors or is there another way to think about it? Um, seems like a two-part question. Part one, like what is the cost of creating a vector? And part two, what are the attributes which go in to actually make a vector? Um, so yes, you probably need GPUs. Uh, I have no idea the amount of data that you're working with, whether that's streaming data or whether you can run it in a batch. Um, there will be costs associated with that, obviously. Um, you just have to weigh off what the ROI on that's going to be. And you can define what goes into a vector. So you can define uh, if you want to have location or events be part of that. You know, if I was building this service out for you, then yeah, we would work together and say, uh, probably the, all the, the more data you have, the better. Like if data becomes irrelevant, then the machine learning algorithm will just not incorporate this into the vector. Um, but if you didn't, for some reason, didn't want to include location, then yeah, you can just filter that out of the training of the, the actual um, data. Cool. Oh. Sorry, just one more. Um, the risk of human bias or, or these vectors being manipulated for nefarious purposes, mm. is that a risk that's been considered? Yeah, um, so I think this is a very open problem in the machine learning community in general. Um, you've probably all heard the examples of like uh, asking a machine learning algorithm to generate something about a hospital and it's always saying that the nurse is female, which obviously isn't objectively true. There is inherent bias in these machine learning algorithms, but people's custom data, I wouldn't actually say that, that that is that much of a problem, but when we're exposing these models to the world, then it, it's a very clear problem. Um, it is a problem which is actively being sold, and I've seen firsthand this getting better over the last two or three years. So there, is a, there are explicit fields of research which work in debiasing these models, such that we have fairer representations of, um, you know, half the time it will associate a nurse with a man, and the other half it will associate it with a woman. Um, hi there. Hi. Um, so I've got a question about targeting. Because when, let's say it's uh, Meta, for example, using, but it would apply to any, any any system we're targeting. What what would you say the value is in just not doing any targeting whatsoever and leaving it completely open? Because there's still that kind of lack of trust, I think, of you know you know who your customers are, so you want to include the target. But are we actually just almost 
limiting ourselves by including any manual targeting data whatsoever? Uh, yes and no. So I've spoken to a variety of agencies about this specific question. Um, and generally, it seems like the broad target, generally, not in all cases, the broad targeting works better. If you have a very specific set of audience and you understand them well, then detailed targeting can outperform broad targeting. Uh, there's also bias in there based on how you perform the A-B test. So some people are explicitly creating different campaigns. Um, so for the testing campaign, what they've found is that uh, the learnings that the algorithm gets on the testing campaign does not generalize to the main bulk of the ad spend, so they actually lose out on a lot of um, ROI or ROAS by, by doing that. Um, to answer your question, though, uh, I, I think one of the disadvantages is that you lose the audience information, right? Because all Meta will expose to you if you do the broad targeting is the age, the location, um, and the gender of the people who have actually clicked. You lose any demographic or psychographic information about what your audience actually is. And I think while you might be getting higher click-through rates, you might actually lose out on profit because that funnel isn't as well connected with each other. The intent of the ad clicker doesn't actually match up to what the landing page says. So what I would say is the detailed targeting almost forces you to think about your customer journey a lot better than what the broad targeting does. From a purely objective standpoint, broad targeting is likely better, but from a perspective of, hey, do we understand who our audience or who our customer is? I would say just the exercise of working with detailed targeting does help you understand your customer better and therefore create a better experience for your customer. <laughs> Sorry, last one, uh, one last one. Sure. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, segments and creating segment vectors. Is there a way to pass such a vector into, for example, Facebook targeting environment? No. Um, what you can do is uh, you can get the emails from the vectors that you have, uh, and then you can use lookalike audiences. So uh, on your end, you would segment your customers, get their emails, put them into Facebook, and then Facebook can use that as a prior. So basically, it can say, okay, what are the, uh, it in itself will learn the, the Facebook level vectors over these emails, and then it can find similar profiles based on that. Cool, okay, um, I think we can call it there then. Thank you very much for sitting through that boring talk um, and I hope you've come away with learning one or two things. <laughs>